is going and she really really very much appreciates it so without further ado uh robert you're getting ready to go on something really really cool and i'm so excited and mark and i are both excited that you're that you came on because you know we want to give you our support and you know this is just a, a great thing so if you want to jump in and tell us uh you know how long you've been planning this expedition and all right. the good stuff yeah well uh, i'll start off by saying thanks for having me on especially at this late of notice you know it's basically crunch time for us this, these are the uh, final days getting ready to go and um this is culminating after five years that i've been waiting and planning this expedition from when i got to witness this area and this was one of the sketchiest things i've ever seen really really bad time to have been in there seen it um total accident you know we dropped two thousand two thousand foot down a mountain into some bad stuff on accident had to go two thousand foot back out on top of an eight mile uh, exit which added about six and a half seven more miles and um so we were beat blown out and uh what we saw the gravity of it was so horrendous and plus night was descended upon us and things and, we, and it was just one of those deals you know we're, we're going to pass through. A lot of my guys, actually, you could see the panic in them. A um, few of them mixed vets and things, but nobody had ever, including myself, seen the gravity of what we had to progress through before we got to what we call the lodge feature. And um, and then we just, you know, it was just one of those things where, hey, look, n now is not the time to be anywhere near something like this. You know, it was beyond, it's beyond anything I've ever seen. It's beyond anything I've ever heard of. Um, the amount of damage and stuff, we can go into that a little bit, but... Um, and foliage manipulation and all the things like that that were done in there were just the gravity of it was so horrendous that that uh, it was mind blowing. And so we just made the determination: look, we'll come back and document this when we're prepared and get the right team and the right thing, you know. And just so happens that um, assembling this team and waiting for it to organically kind of come together was the only way to really do it. And um, and I gotta say thanks to Chris Reinhardt because uh, on Discover Sasquatch when he was interviewing me on that. Um, it came up and everything and, and the details came up and, you know, he just said right after the show, he said, Hey, let's just do this. You know, if you're willing, you know, we will do this. And so, you know, that initiation began. And then I just have to say that maybe divine intervention or whatever, but, um, the people that have come forward and that we've assembled to put on this team are absolutely off the charts, you know, stellar. I couldn't have asked for a greater group of guys. And, um, you know, they vowed to basically make this happen. So, uh, there's no turning back on this thing. We This needs to be documented. This is the chance to do it. And we've all agreed that regardless of what occurs, we're going to get it done. So, It, it really has been the perfect storm mm -hmm. after Chris said that, because it just seemed like from what you were telling me earlier in the week, that it just, everything just fell into place. And <laughs> you, you've got some incredible guys going with you. One of which is, is which I think is such a coup in, in Ron who's who's going with you yeah and that, that amazed me as well i mean I, i've seen ron's name and, and everything affiliated with my stuff before and everything but he he really was tenacious about reaching out and um tickled me to death you know just about blush uh you know he's he made the mention that it was you know it was our work and the methodology and and things that were out on a whole nother level and a whole nother scale compared to what I think anyone's doing for sure and maybe what anyone's ever done i think don't think we approach this enigma the same way um and you know maybe it's because of our other work and things and and i came to the sasquatch enigma bringing that other methodology in uh from other research and, and and big scale behind the scenes work and stuff and so maybe that gave us a little bit of an advantage or just a, a different a different way of doing things different way of approaching it and um and so Ron gave me a great appreciation for that. But, you know, what he did was he knew the need and he knew he could fit that need. So he was really, really tenacious about following up with us and saying, hey, um, you know, we want to see this happen. We want to make this happen for you. And um, and so, you know, I brought him on and I, I had no idea of his profession um, at the time that I brought him in. And um, and now just say, you know, that's just another another drop in the bucket that of, of excellence uh, you know i'd have to say this is uh, very lucky and very fortunate to have everyone you know but with uh, ron's profession what he brings to the table is is unheard of you know and and what's what uh tell me again what part of the service is he with 
He's USFS, so okay. uh, United States Forest Service, and he's a uh, an officer for them, and uh, he's been a manager as well. And for so he's in 19 years running so far. So you know, no newbie. Okay. You know, he's he's been there and done that, seen it, and um, and like I said, you know, willing to come forward, um, just with it's not just his opinion because he knows he's been there and done this. He's and and as well, you know, Ron being a private researcher. Um, on the side, no one knows he's US, uh, USFS, and he's gone all kinds of expeditions and, and you know, been involved in, in a myriad array of things, and just, you know, nobody knew his professional aspect, basically, so. So, right. explain the area a little bit. What's the what's the drive behind trying to get all these guys together to, to go back to document what you found that first trip? I mean, what's, what's pushing you to go in there? Well, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things, and one is the, um, you know, I've had we did the Oxford Luzanne, some of that study we did up there and did uh, the collection for DNA up there. And, and of course the range itself was going to have something on it cause it's almost completely abandoned. There's no trails. There's 90% of it. There's no access and um, not feasible helicopter and stuff. I mean, you couldn't get a horse on most of it. And, um, and so I already had known about uh, awesome activity there and especially by really big, big individuals and uh, when we did the Oxford stuff, that's where we got our first 23 inch print and uh, and all that. And we out of about there was probably collectively 170 prints, I think, something like that. And then a hand prints, hand prints, 16 inches long, 15 inches uh, spread, eight inch wide palm. And uh, that goes to that big boy. And um, that's the subject that we were able to get, you know, seven inch gray hair from with a still hydrated follicle and whatnot. But. So that range itself was was considerable in what we were c coming up on it. Plus, we had reports of them being highly aggressive, and then we can see reports of people vanishing and at times in other parts of the range, and they find them with no shoes, of course, right? Miles in the middle of nowhere. It takes climbing gear to get to the remains. Um, <clears throat> and then um, we had report of a and, and of a dog being snatched right in front of a guy. Um, his one of his lab was taken oh from the trail in front of him. And he actually kind of wigged out, took his other dog home, went back up and tracked it out and found his what was left of his lab, you know, mm. which was just the head and the part of the spine. And then um, and then as well, you know, there were some other injuries and stuff that were really intriguing. Near where we tracked the big one we got the Oxford sample from, um, a woman at the lower parking lot at the trailhead actually was hit in the head with a basketball-sized rock um, uh, sideways in the head. And there's no upslope there for it to even come from. That put her in intensive care and seeing these reports on the news and stuff of course they're not going to give you an idea of what it's attributed to and then uh, we did our study in there on for the oxford stuff and we released it uh through the local news which is i'm not sure which network affiliate it is and they did a big special on it and it scared the studio heads and then they chopped the special down and and it became a big controversy and um and so we were working the other side and working the top of that uh range let's so to speak speak and um and that's where on our return trip after uh two days up there that's when we had run into this what we call the kill zone and then progressed through that to what we found was what we would call the lodge feature and um i guess i can do a brief explanation so the kill zone um we call it that because it, it's just like that so it's it's just like what we it's not somewhere that we know they kill things or whatever um, although I do want to add that one of the, the USFS guy at the time, not Ron, who was with us during the Oxford collection, um, told me that up to 30 people have vanished on the other side in a single year. And um, and he said without 90 percent of them going uninvestigated because there's no sign of a crime. And um, and so, you know, when we came upon we, we dropped, we were on the way out on the we were on the other side, we were on the way out. And we, like I said, we went down a wrong trail because we were on mountain bikes and we were cruising. So we had 50, pa 50 pound packs on mountain bikes. Um, there were six of us and we took a wrong turn at speed, uh, dropped 2000 feet down the mountain and it flattened out. And where it flattened out just suddenly became something that I've never witnessed before. And that was that the forest itself had been cleared. Uh, every bough, every branch, um, all, even all the green shrubbery plants and everything on the ground were also gone. But every bow and branch up to 40 to 60 foot had been removed and snapped off. And a lot of them like snapped, you know, two feet from the tree, not right at the tree like snow load usually does or whatever. It was, and plus they were all gone. And, and all the upper canopy, the 40, 40 to 60 foot of upper canopy uh, to these 100 foot trees was all still intact. And um, 
and I've never seen something had to have cleared all that out, right? But there was nothing on the ground. So all these boughs and all the branches, you know, thousands of them collectively um, were gone. And in their place, though, on the ground uh, was full size trees carried in amongst the trees that were standing. So there was no thinning out of the standing trees. There was just as many as other places in the forest, except on the floor, they were large, large, some of them bigger than the trees that were standing in there, or a lot of them were. And they were stacked around like pixie sticks in there. And I, and I try to explain it as just my fingers jammed in every direction. But you can imagine these are 100 foot trees, uh, two to three foot thick um, were just everywhere. You couldn't run or walk in any direction. You'd either have to climb over a couple or duck under them. And so it was just impassable. And um, we came where the, I guess, USFS had cut a trail through there for years. And then there was trees laid all the way across it. And collectively throughout this whole thing, probably a hundred trees we had to cross, but you could see where they had done this year after year after year. Um, in one fork, you know, they'd set a tree and somebody would come cut it with a chainsaw at the trail and they'd set another one and they'd cut it again. And we saw seven high where they had done that and um, blocking it. And then we came to a point in the trail where they didn't just go to that extent. They actually dropped one of the biggest trees we've ever seen on the ground. Um, and it was at least three foot thick in diameter, but the root ball and roots and rocks and dirt and everything were intact and on it. And it was about 12 foot across the root ball. And this was stabbed directly in the trail. So the trail progressed right under the root ball with a hundred foot, 120, 130 or whatever foot tree fully attached to it and completely blocking the trail. So at that point we actually had to climb over and around it. We couldn't go over it naturally because it's 12 foot high. And um, we had to actually physically make our way over trees around that. And that had completely circumvented and blocked that, our path. And we probably progressed maybe a thousand foot, maybe a quarter of a mile. <clears throat> and um, and then I noticed up to my left, and it was stayed like this. There was thinner spots and thicker spots, but still no canopy, tons of big stuff laying everywhere. And um, And we were on the old trail. Of course, we were having to cross trees left and right with our bikes and packs and um, and we knew we were, we knew we were in the wrong place, but we were heading the right general direction. And, you know, we knew that there'd be a connecting trail eventually going back up. So we progressed. And on my left, I had come to a point where I looked up and uh, uh, about 30 feet up in the tree was, you know, you've, we've all seen examples when you have a few standing trees and then you have a tree kind of woven in those right. you know, to, like this up here. And then they'll stab them across. And, you know, most examples are, what, 8 or 10 foot, 12 foot long, maybe 20 foot long, but still, you know, 4, 5, 6 inches thick or whatever. And there was a tree 30 feet up that was wedged in like six other big trees. And it was at least 40 feet long and 18 inches thick. And it was 30 feet off the ground. And it was in there so tight, pinched in these other standing live trees, that it was that when you'd look in line with it, it bent like a snake through those trees. And the amount of force to bend an 18-inch or 12-inch thick tree, you know, you imagine hitting a telephone pole with a car. Um, All right. They wobble a little bit, but they, they fold the car around them. Um, and so the, the amount of pressure it would take from those six trees to weave it in and have it in, eventually warp it and bend it like that, that was, that really, even outside all the stuff we saw on the side, that really sank in that, um, like one subject couldn't have done any of this two subjects even big 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 ones couldn't have done all this it had to be three or more working in unison in a cooperative effort to have br to brought these things in there that were in there and to done work like that and um and then um, just just beyond that down the hill from there a little off down slope all of a sudden i realized i looked down there and i thought oh my gosh you know everyone's looking at this thing in the trees and i'm looking trying down slope trying to see where everything goes and i realized i'm seeing boughs on the ground but they're not on the ground they're in kind of a pile and then i realized wow that's all the branches and there were still green ones so this had been this is ongoing and there was a lot of old stuff in there and then green too but what i'm looking at is all these boughs from the last quarter mile of travel in this large area around us are now in this big stack down there on down slope from us and i'm kind of on a finger coming out and i thought what in the world how did they all get there and i got to really look in and they were covering a pile of the you know trees maybe a foot thick to 18 inches thick 20 30 40 feet long and they're all woven together like a beaver dam just tighter than crap just tangled and like a pile with all these boughs and 
and these other bleached deadwood branches on top that were, you know, four inches thick and 15 feet, 18 feet long. And we're also mixed in all that. And then as I looked kind of up slope, which I had looked right beyond this point, um, I had looked right beyond this point down to what I'm looking at now. And as I kind of looked up slope, I realized the slope itself wasn't the slope. It was dirt on top of all these boughs and in holes and stuff. You could see where it was falling through the ground. So it was it, the entire extension of it. We could see was probably 70 feet. And then um, and then it went above. You know, the slope went down and it kind of didn't, you know, it was kind of built out as the hill dropped off. And, um, and you know, I would have to guess maybe 10 foot tall, what we could see of that built into the ground. But that's how much it was protruding from what would should, I, I would assume, should have been the normal hill. And, um, you know, the only thing that came to mind, it just looked like a giant beaver dam, 100 foot long, 70 foot long beaver dam uh, made out of giant trees. And then the logic of, of thinking about my, you know, all the boughs and all the branches for this giant area. I mean, it's, it's truckloads of the many truckloads of this foliage debris would have been there. And it was all padded in tight and on top of this with dirt on top. And we realized, or I did, I guess, you know, it, it hit my heart. It's like, you know, for one, what did all this? I knew. And then, you know, when you have the big tree tied in the other ones, that big territorial marker there, we know what's doing that. And, um, and then you have this giant feature down here, and then it's just two plus two to, oh my gosh, these guys have cleared the entire woods here, 40, 60 foot up. And there, it's an open zone. You can see completely through it. But yet, you know, the bottom five to seven feet is nothing but giant stacked logs where you can't get through it. You can't move. But they have 100% of the advantage. They can see over this. They can go boreal and just cruise right across the top. And then at the same time, you're fodder. A deer can't move through there. Uh, nothing like that could move through that. And, um, and so that's why we reference that the kill zone, because it's very much like you'd make around a hold or an emplacement in the military or whatever. You'd either clear the ground and they put mines out there. They put tank traps or whatever. But that zone is your protective zone where you can see what's going on. And you have the advantage, the tactical advantage to secure your emplacement. And here this thing is built around this massive lodge feature. So, uh, you know, that's that's kind of what we assumed it was, was basically it's a controlled zone um, that you really wouldn't want to get in there, you know. And um, and just to finish that out, um, go on, Sophie. Thank you, Annie. Just to finish that out, uh, the um, I, I had ripped a tendon, and a lot of my guys were panicking, and they were kind of on their bikes, kind of like at the upper edge, like, man, we want to leave, we want to leave. And, and I just told him go, you know, and um, one guy that was with me, Willie Jackson, like I said, I give him a lot of credit because um, I, I told him as well, I mean, go up ahead. I'll be I'll be up around the corner because it got to the point to where I, I honestly believed we may not make it out past that point, period. And we were getting some heavy thuds down below, down below the roll of that hill. We couldn't see. And, um, and the other guys, man, they were pretty quick about moving on. They didn't really argue too much. Willie argued a little. <laughs> And, uh, and so I stopped, and this is kind of nutty, but I took off my pack, got a candy bar. My tendon was ripped. I was screwed. I'm pushing a bike with a pack on it. So I went to get a kind of a crutch, and I was going to use a crutch and push the bike. And, um, and when I popped this, I haven't told this part of it yet. So when I popped this small tree out, it actually so stupid, it's comical. It popped out, and dirt flew up and hit me square in the face and in the eyes. So it really actually almost made me giggle. I felt so much like a wounded little lamb, right, in, in next to a, a wolf den by accident, like fell off a cliff next to a wolf den. That's what it felt like. And so I'm thinking, oh, great. You know, I'm the wounded party. Now I'm in the back. I'm, now I'm blind. I can't see anything. And, uh, and here I'm fodder. I'm gone. And then I hear this big stepping coming up from down below. And... Uh, and, and I thought, oh, my gosh, what's what's this going to be? You know, and, oh, hell. So I started moving. And uh, thankfully, Willie did not listen to me. And he had actually gone up around the corner and just stopped. And when I got to him, there was no one else in sight. They were all gone. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you guys can hear that knocking in the background. I hope not. Um, they have a kid knocking over there. But anyway, so they were all gone. So Willie escorted me out. And I will give them credit, though, before we got about – halfway back of course it was completely black and dark by then and um, we're using lights to get out with the bikes and and at times I, I actually kept my crutch for a while and i was catching it on trees 
But at times, you know, I could coast the bike, and that was my give a relief to my tendon. But most of it, we still had to climb elevation. I had to get 2,000 feet out of there and um, or so. And uh, But half the guys did come back. When we made about halfway out, they had already been coming in. Like like two or three of those guys had come back in. They got to the parking lot. They thought, man, screw this. So it's dark. Those guys ain't out. We just left them in there. We're going to go back and get them. So then we all, all went out together. But And uh, – that's that's pretty much what led me to want to go back in there and I, you know was so special in, about this so well uh, we we had chris on as you know last friday and he was talking about how you pretty much have every hour of every day timed out on when you go in there so when you get to that area you're not going to be hitting it you know late afternoon just because you don't want to be in there at nighttime you're going to try to to get to maximize daylight hours in there before you get out and and what do you want to what are you going to investigate when you get in there well i'll, I'll just give you the, the quick rundown so when we move in we're going to be doing it early early in the morning and not super early um but early a.m and we're gonna there's a sentinel position about a quarter of a mile in on the trail uh, i've been in there several times you know up in the upper oh, portion okay. of this area um but i've been run out and been cross communicated with uh, several times at the same location and it's where a, the a sentinel is apparently and um and so we're gonna pass that point and then descend off trail so we're gonna actually get between the lodge feature and the or the territorial area and the sentinel position and then we're gonna set up first camp and then we're gonna basically see how aggressive they get that first night um, see if they remove us from the mountain that first night or whatever and then the following day regardless of what happens um, we're going to enter into the actual kill zone lodge area and um, try to get on, you know, the end of their sleepy time, whatever, 11 o'clock, noon, something like that, be on that target. And then spend as much time as we can um, safely spend there before moving on to another camp position. So I'd like to get to really take a good survey of the lodge area. That's if they allow us to get close to it um, and, and, and measure out and see how big the kill zone is and estimate the amount of trees and board lumber or board for lumber and all that that's that's been toted in there and um because there's obviously no we we never found a hollow spot in the forest where they ripped all these giant trees out so they must be bringing them in from you know a, a varied area and um traveling them quite a distance to get in there and so we're going to do our best to be can to measure that whole thing out and take and document that and then we'll be uh moving forward beyond that point even deeper um past the lodge feature and this is where i think this night could be the sketchiest because at that point we would have already r crawled all over their thing and then we're going to stay one more night and then that uh, will be out the next day so we'll never be during the entire from when we make our first camp throughout second camp we'll never be more than you know a mile probably on either side a mile or two on either side of this territorial feature and they do have it marked um, when you descend into their deal they do have a they do have it marked with kind of what you'd call a fence line um, of big trees that are laid kind of in a linear fashion. And then they have where they set the poles, like a, what we call teepee structures against the standing tree. And they'll, mm -hmm. they'll stand those. And that's basically your gate to go into the territorial zone. And so those, they have those very well marked. And um, it's interesting because they, that's exactly the same thing they do here. It's just with the, with the existing, you know, right biology ecology you know what i mean so the trees are all different in different sizes and and then depending on what we're seeing is that uh, certain areas must hold really much larger creatures because the damage is exactly the same but it's all with big big trees yeah, a know? giant scale yeah and that's yeah. what and you know i've seen that stuff before and then this particular place i just never i've never even seen a photograph of anybody that's ever been put up that showed the scale of this stuff. So that's what we want to bring out is the documentation of this. Yeah. And, um, well, that's it right there, man. I mean, that in and of itself is, is valuable enough. Yeah. Just to, yeah. Just to document that structure you're talking about with all that giant, uh, you know, forest stuff broken down and it is crazy, you know, and it shows cooperative effort of a number of very large subjects. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not even within like the same family unit, you know, you wouldn't have, you know, five, 12 foot males generally in the same little family group or family unit. From what we've seen, they did, the groups just aren't built that way. Um, big males have their family groups. They stay away from them most of the time. We already knew this, but where do they go when they're staying away from them? And this apparently 
seems to be where they go when they're staying away from the family groups. So congregate, you know, much like um, I say natives or I say, you know, the clubhouse for bikers or whatever, but it, they, they congregate the men of the, of the deal. So it shows a, a different aspect to their behavior. We don't suppose a lot. We get everything um, indicated from evidence one way or another. So, but it, it demonstrates a lot more about their behavior and social structure and, and the fact that maybe, you know, the big males aren't all, tel aren't all territorial and staying away from one another, you know, in all actuality, it appears that they all go get together and go someplace. Why each family group may have uh, a territory, you know, it really doesn't pay to be beating each other up when you're 12 foot tall. So, right. um, and, and we assume one way or another, but this, this will dictate by itself what's going on. Cause the amount of cooperative effort is tremendous, you know, um, it's a lot. It's it's so yeah. much that I don't think uh, there's any doubt that they're extremely social with each other and all that. And you know, and in, in, even here in Florida, there's a there's a a very large gap between when we documented uh, for the first couple of times and what those individuals look like. Right. And when we finally started hearing giant things coming through the bushes, there was a great a big amount of time. And in our research, there was a separation clearly between these big ones. And they did have more rugged features when we caught them on film. The faces seemed more, you know, just like monstrous, actually. Right. You would rarely see these individuals. And when they were around, everything acted different. So the, the whole area was different. So I could kind of confirm some of, like, you know, that safe assumption stuff you're talking about where there's, yeah. you know, these males seem to get together. I think personally they're hunting. Well, you know, I mean, when you look at something like the kill zone with a big lodge feature and things like that in it, um, it appears that it has a lot more going on than they need to do to make a hunt. You know what I mean? Like, there's no feasible reason to make that giant kill zone because no deer is going to get in there. Uh, uh, bear really either. It's so, you know. But where you're at, it, I mean, who knows, man? I mean, right. this is, I never heard of anything now, like I, that for where they're sticking the trees in the ground upside down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes you wonder if they're if they're hiding something. If there's like a a cave back in there, or well, that's what's been that's what's been supposed a cave, or you know maybe a potential burial site. Um, Are you guys going to try to go in? Yeah, absolutely. We'll do it as far as we can get it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. As far as far as we can get it, as far as they'll let us take it. So, um, but what I have noticed, like we've seen plenty of hunting scenarios being played out by them, and we've seen big ones hunt but they usually hunting with their family group which is all smaller individuals and so yeah. we've never seen a case where more than one big one was hunting together with another one and really? in the in the glst for instance you know at the family group so when they return we 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 would map the travel of the big one coming in um doing his howl and then you get a knock or a grunt response from the family unit you just get one and it's usually not really audible to your ears. We pick him up on the big pea dishes and stuff. His howl would be so audible it just rock the world. And uh, but what they're doing is is he's howling as he's moving in, maybe from five miles or even more away. And then they are signaling back, just not enough to give up their location. But as he moves, he can triangulate where that's coming from. And yeah. generally, they don't repeat very much the same response. Like I say, it'll be a grunt or it'll be a knock or it'll be a, a quick howl or it'll be something. But they're they're breaking it up. They're trying not to reveal where they're at the group and then he'll locate them. And we we were able to track speed um, and progression, all that stuff. So because we can track them with the dish and how fast he's progressing, like, say, down the riverbeds and stuff like that. And we would know when he's coming in, but we could never find his sign. And we even, you know, we recorded him coming in and killing a big dog one time and and a bunch of other stuff. And um went down there to that area and found the rest of the group's sign, including the first real small one we had found, the, the infant, and, um, and, but not his. And it, in midwinter, the only time I saw him, his sign was midwinter. I saw where he had crossed part of the frozen creek, and the ice was about three inches thick, and each hop he broke completely through it and, um, and went to the bottom and stepped again. And the step gaps were eight, eight foot, and his longest was 12 foot exiting. Jeez. And then, um, and then, but no more. So like another four years went by and not a sign of him. I mean, not a sign. We knew he was coming in and out because we, you know, our past history, but still no sign until the, uh, and then one day my buddy Bob, 
we're, we're walking on one bank and he looks, he's about 30, 40 feet away and he's looking down at the ground kind of toward the sun angle and he saw that shine, you know, a tracker calls shine. It's when anything's pressed flat. You can see it in grass, leaves, dirt. Right. And if you're opposite the solar angle, then it shows up as kind of a bright spot. And he saw this form on the ground and he said, is that a footprint? And I said, where? He said, right at your feet. And I looked down. And I'm a tracker, man. I'm good. I track a track a coyote across the parking lot, dude. I mean, I, no problem. And he and I didn't see it. And I looked down, and I still didn't see it. And the reason being, it was so big. It was so big. My brain wouldn't put two and two together. Um, and each toe was over over two and a half inches wide. And um, and I saw that front structure. Then I looked back, and I saw the impact into the ground, and realized, wow, it's one print. And the toes were kind of splayed a little sideways. You know, they're they're hyper flexible. So yeah, people go, oh, the toes bent this way. It's for wears boots or man, toes bend all over the place. So that's irrelevant. But you know, nobody in twenty three inch feet's got boots. Sorry, but never happened. So, but anyway, but I, I kind of backed up a little. And I looked down and I realized, oh my, I mean, really, you know, wow, oh my, oh my gosh. And I knew instantly that's him. That's him. That's him. That's him. That's him. And now I realize how big this dude really was. No wonder he was traveling, making such speed down those rivers and stuff. We thought he was running full sprint. And he's probably not. He's probably just doing a slow jog. I mean, the guy's huge. And um, and so anyway, I had gone back in. We hung out there for a little while. And I found, what was that? What do you think? He's like around 13 feet? No, he's 12. So we, so I said, you know, I've, I've seen him. And I've been 40 feet from him for an hour and 40 minutes looking at him. So the, oh, um, or off and on. And uh, that's all the one on waking the giant video. That's when that happened. But so, but needless to say, so the next day uh, we stayed a little while in there and I saw one print that was compacted into the riverbed. Now this is hard packed gravel with a lot of bromide salts and caliche and stuff. So you could drive a car on it and you, and it doesn't push it in the ground. The tire tracks don't push in the ground. Um, some spots, I mean, they do, but in this gravel bed with rocks, no way. And um, you couldn't dent it you know, hard as you can kick it, you can't do anything. But yet there was the heel print and the fore part of the foot was on some larger rock, but the heel print was pressed in probably three eighths of an inch into that material. And to do that, to do that was, you know, probably four or five times the surface pressure of a car on its tires. And it blew my mind. So, but that's all we found. And then, um, the next day I went in there with another guy and he ended after 45 minutes, uh, he ended up bailing on me and I started where we stopped before. And, um, and I sat down for like, you know, 30 minutes or whatever. And I hung out and I let, let the ring settle and listened around. Cause now I'm a little more leery. And, uh, and so I went on and progressed from there and ended up picking up, a, uh, the smell of, of deer, you know, uh, just the smell of deer. Or actually, I think the first thing I got was urine, like human urine, but real strong. Couldn't find a wet spot or anything. Then I smelled deer. Um, and if you ever hunted, you know, or you slaughter a deer, you know what a deer is. Yeah, that smell yeah, is real distinctive. Yeah, it's real distinctive. You know it's a deer. And um, and I didn't see any carcass. I didn't see anything anywhere, no drag marks. And then when I exited onto the riverbed, sure enough, there it was. There was tracks that were a deer had to come and approach this bank that I'm on now. And before it ever reached the bank, maybe eight or ten feet from the bank, something had apparently grabbed it that didn't leave any prints in the sand. And you could see swipe marks and fight marks from the deer all the way back to the bank where it was barely touching the ground and just swiping, just swiping the sand. And so something had it up, you know, and just it was kicking off and took, pulled it to the bank. And, and I snapped right there. I knew exactly, oh, wow, this dude nabbed a deer because nothing else could reach out that far right. and, and get anything. And I knew it had probably happened at night. And then, But in the sand just near there, um, there was juvenile prints. And I think they're 13 inch or something like that. And, um, and you know, that full showed all the form, you know, mid tarsal break and, and the cupped front and just light, light pressure on the heel, heavy on the front and all this stuff in the rolling. So it was definitely, it was what it was. Plus I was in the middle of absolutely nowhere and there's no people running around barefoot out there. So, um, so I, I knew that there was a smaller subject and I knew that subject is not the one that grabbed that deer, but he's out there running around on the sand. And so I progressed a little more up the riverbed. I'm being quiet, you know, by myself. I don't make any noise. And I, I can do pretty well. And um, and I cruised up and I saw this grayish dirt mound. And I thought, well, I, it looked to me hey, like... Excuse me one ahead. second. Hey, Mods, we got some bots in here. So if y'all could pop those guys out, that would be much appreciated. So uh, 
Yeah, so so go on. So uh, I saw this gray dirt pile, and it, what it did was give me kind of a quiet advantage to get farther out of the riverbed, I thought, because it's such a soft gray dirt. I know I can get on that and not make any noise. And it just so happened, and it was just, the way, you know, sub, subconsciously, psychically, whatever, maybe that's what made me want to go there. But um, I went over to that dirt mound, and I got up on top of it, and as I did, uh, I got to the backside of it, I felt something weird, just felt presence just in general. And I knelt down and I thought, well, I'm going to get my, get my camera. And I went ahead and grabbed my little video camera there. And, um, and right when I stood back up, then this 57 feet in front of me was how far it was after we measured, but he was laying on the ground kind of on his side, maybe, and just a big dark mass under the, the foliage front, you know, see, it's just like my hand like this and he's sideways on the ground below it. And so I could see the brightness of the leaves. I could see through the mass, but down here was just a giant dark shape. But who knows, you know, river deposit, uh, you know, that's common. That's common. Or maybe even a bull laying there. But whatever it was, exploded into activity. And when I say exploded, and I mean it was, you couldn't comprehend the mass can move that fast. Mass cannot accelerate. That much mass cannot accelerate that fast. So I've spooked. You know, collectively, there's hundreds and hundreds of cows, big Brahma bulls, um, all kinds of stuff in the bush before. I've walked right up on them, even in the dark, and had them panic and explode awake. And this was nothing like that. It was three to five times that type of ferocity and mass and explosion. And it was horrendous sounding, and it broke a lot of foliage. And, man, it stopped me, and he didn't go anywhere. He just rolled over, and then I could see the mass in there, how tall that, that dark spot was. And, um, and he just stopped, dead stopped. And then right to my left, um, something took a couple steps and maybe just 40 feet to my left. And so I, I didn't even, I hadn't even had time to turn the camera on yet. I just stood up. So before I did anything, I sent a text to my lady and just like, you know, hey, I don't know what just happened. This is, this could get bad, whatever. And then, um, and then I lit the camera up and as I did, um, I start to talk to the camera and tell what happened and the subject next to my side. I turn to my side and that subject starts walking away and you can hear him walk off and he's maybe, you know, 200 pounds, maybe a little more than that. Um, not certainly not this like this thing in front of me. And then I turn back and the thing in front of me broke uh, to le my left through the trees, broke and ran and unbelievable movement and thuds and mass and I got to see, you know, the legs, you know, two, two, two behind the trees and go across and the shadow run from that. And, um, and of course you, and then I turn camera back and he'd already moved and then he breaks and moves again. And, and then you hear him on the camera, brush stuff and take off. And I thought, oh, you know, this is, this is him. You know, we just found his prints the day before. And this is after, you know, I think all together six or eight years of studying the family group and, you know, getting real close, you know, climbing right in there with them, 40, 50 feet from the subjects and being right surrounded by them and all this stuff. And I've done this a lot of times with that group. And, um, you know, I got some poor video of the mom, you know, pretty close, 80 feet and stuff like that. And um, but so I wasn't I, I didn't want to naturally go right in after him, but I did go after the smaller one. And. I was listening intently and, and he had just gone quiet. He'd just gone full stealth mode or whatever. So I expected he almost would still be right in there somewhere and I'd be able to pick him out because there's a lot of tunnels through the foliage there. And what he had done is moved out back around and flanked my position there. They moved all the way around to behind the big thicket where the big male was then and joined him. And um, so there was nothing left to do, I guess, but to go in and look where the big guy got up. And he hadn't taken off. Um, this subject couldn't have really moved without making some kind of noise or revealing himself. He's just He's too big. big. Yeah. yeah, there was just no way. And and so, but he had hunkered down in there and I knew he had because all that mass of breaking and movement just stopped, ceased. And so I got the balls up and over the next five minutes or so, um, you see it on video, I move in there and find where he had been and there was damage at six foot. So when he was totally on all fours, he was still six foot tall. And... Um, and that's all that would fit under where where what was in there. And so I started to track a little bit and found where he had, there was a place where you could no longer go forward, but I could see another 40 or 50 feet. There was a fallen log and then it got real thick. And I didn't hear him, go, I, I knew if he had gone through that, I would have heard it again. 
You know, right. I would have heard more than I just heard. And, um, and, but I did hear a lot. So I was looking for how, which direction and what he'd done is hung a right, which put him now behind the foliage, uh, the, tr the layer of line of trees and things. And, uh, might have to do a cat removal here. So, <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so I, so I, I knew he was back in there and I, th and I thought he was in the middle and this went behind and back behind all of this was a, a big dirt bank about, you know, 12 or 14 foot tall and it was vertical dirt eroded, no way to go up it. And, um, and it was back and behind created this kind of barrier. So I'm thinking, and it's open back there, uh, to one side and it tight to the other. And I thought, well, he's not going to have gone to the open side. So he must've gone pivoted here and gone out. And when I looked on the ground for that, there was a spot where he, when he turned, he was went forward and didn't see a lot of sign other than big padding. But when he turned, he broke the ground. And I could not dent the ground with my heel. It's hard packed clay uh, and river to, river sediment deposit and then long time dried, you know. And you you just couldn't hurt it with your foot. But he had broke in and kicked out about a 14 inch wide piece of it. And his heel had sank in about six inches deep at a 45 degree angle and broke that surface out when he pushed sideways. So when he changed directions with that mass, it just took the ground out and deep. And I thought, oh my gosh, man, like, like it really sank in. So I, like on video, I get a quick measurement and it's six inches across the heel. And, um, and I, kn I knew, you know, how big this was at that point and the weight. And, and so I went ahead and followed him where he turned and then he, he ripped, we went through that and then he ripped a left sure enough back where the dirt wall closed in with the trees and got tighter. And then it turned and it formed kind of a tunnel right back into the tree zone where they are now. And so I looked on the ground, went around the corner, looked on the ground, and he had made that corner, gone erect, took two or three steps, gone back quad again, and then went through that, that hole. And where he had stood up and placing that weight and standing up, he left two big 23-inch prints. And, um, and uh, like I said on video, I'm staring at him going, those are 23-inch prints, you know. And he had just gone around the corner and stopped and he actually had doubled back because when I started making a progression and the dirt wall is closing in on one side and the, and the foliage is closing on the other side and then the dirt wall turns and you have to make that corner to go in the foliage and it all overhangs. There's a big tunnel in the foliage there. And so it's like a total ambush point, man. Total pinch point. Absolutely. And this guy hasn't gone anywhere. He's through this and I can't see 10 feet into this mess. And, um, as a long story short, as I stayed there, like an hour and 40 minutes in there with him, and um, George was obviously the smaller subject. I ended up finding his prints, and we identified him. And this will actually go to what you were saying, Mark, about how they can be different at different times um, when they're with, with a big adult. So, um, But each time I would approach that pinch point, something would approach the pinch point with me on the other side of the foliage. And, you know, we all know nothing does that that's not going to grab you or eat you or ambush you. Nothing approaches the right. pinch point with you. He was going to see if you, you were going to, yeah. you were going in, you were getting got. Yeah. And, and so anything you go in this way is going to come out this way. You know, the only thing that's going to meet you at that point. And so he kept doing it. Every time I progressed back there, it kept doing it. But it was also making noise at that point. And now I realize it might have been just snapping big stuff right there to keep me from going any farther because it knew that was going to scare me. But this wasn't even the big guy. What I later realized was the big guy had gone. He was sitting back about 40 feet uh, standing there. And this was the smaller subject that was paralleling me in 10, 12 feet from me in there and was meeting me at the pinch point. And so after a while, it just got kind of frustrating. Um, I could see motion every once in a while, but couldn't see anything clearly. And so I took my camera, it was a Zoom Q2 1080, and um, it's primarily an environmental microphone with a camera attached. So the camera's not the greatest. And I raised it at the absolute extension of my arm. And as I raised it to the extension, I clear the brush and behind um, the big one raises up into, the, into a little clear zone to look at the camera and look at my hand. And he just exposes himself from about here up. And so you can see his head and his eye. And he's then he kind of moves in as, as like just within seconds. This is all pretty quick. But as I raise up, he's fully exposed. And then, and then he kind of moves to one side a little bit once he sees my hand move and leaves one, the bridge of his nose, one eye, eyebrow, and three quarters of his crown uh, leaves that open and obvious. And I film him for a minute. 
And, um, and then as I drop my arm down, he raises up another two feet. So he's at least three feet above my arm at full extension. And as he turns to move out, um, he raises another foot or two. And, um, it's really, when you see that, it's really intimidating. And then I, I was thinking, well, I'll try to get a picture of him with the SLR. I know how far he is now in there. And so I got the SLR and I pre, I pre-focused it on something about that distance. And I raised the SLR up and I took another shot and I took another shot to the side and I didn't catch him. What I actually caught was George and I caught half of George's face and there's a lot of foliage in front, but thankfully the focus and field of view for focus, where was he was. So there's a lot of stuff in the way, but you can see what his features clear, you know, it's just a lot of shit. In the way. Estimation. Uh, do what? That was a good estimation. I'm yeah, like, oh. and well, I kind of knew where they were from triangulation. So as I walked back and forth, they were making noise, you know. I've and, done this um, in my in my work too, and it's necessary skill. Yeah, right. Yeah, and no. um, and so thankfully I could do that with that camera. And um, so anyway, so he had George was way different looking. The big one was kind of a charcoal charcoal black. So was his face, um, but just a tinge of brownish to it. Not not chestnut at all. Just a tinge of brown with the black with the charcoal colored. So an ashy, real dark ashy looking. And so, but George now, and we already knew this from the past anyway, because I've been studying the family group for a long time. Seen George, photographed him, has hair dozens of times. And so we know what he looks like. And so and sure enough, there he was. So he was chestnut orange. His hair was funny because it was almost flat to his head. And his head was very round. And um, and it was really flat to his head, so it looks a little comical. But his face is a very dark ash color, just like the big one. And it kind of has a mottled look to it. And you can see the outline of his ear and stuff. But his hair on his head is not very long, which is odd to me. And um, and so, But we caught him with the SLR. And then, like I said, I stayed in there. I wouldn't actually sit down in an open zone behind there. I moved away from there about 150 feet to an open zone. And it was all soft dirt there, you know, where anything would leave a print. And I sat down and I texted some people and this and that. You know, the interaction's still basically happening. They're not leaving. And um, and then I went back over there again to try it again. I mean, I, I wanted, it frustrated me because here they are. They're right there, you know. And all if I could just get my arm around this pinch point, you know, he's right there. But, of course, there goes my arm, there goes my body, you know. Right. All that goes right through the hole as well. And I knew this, so... I got very frustrated, man, really frustrated because this is it. And uh, and so I, I went back in one more time and boy, I was going to try it. And I guess the big one knew that. And um, I got about halfway over into the pinch point and he grunted. And the grunt was not friendly whatsoever. It was short to the point. It was definitely pissed off. I'd taken too much time. Was and he closer than you, than you thought when he grunted? No, no. He okay. was still in the same position. Matter of fact, he hadn't even moved. And... Um, 40 feet's close enough. Trust me. I could feel it. Yeah. He didn't try to make me feel it. This was not an infra pound. I've been hit before and uh, from about the same distance. And it felt like getting hit by a rolled up eight foot chunk of carpet. You know, if somebody could swing it as hard, like a baseball bat, that's what it felt like. So it's his and, way of telling you you've gone far enough. Yeah. We're done. Like we're yeah. done. Like this is over. We're done. You just get the hell out of here now. And I did, I took that, I backed off. And then I had two other smaller ones then crossed my path where I was going heard them go by. So then I thought, wow, he's not, him and George aren't even the only two in here. You know, there's a couple more with them. But I'm going to add, so to Mark's point earlier, what had happened with George was, you know, I've been around George dozens of times. He's basically friendly, you know. And we, we've seen places where he, he mutilated, just horribly killed goats and drained them of their blood, didn't even take the goat, just sucked them dry and and stuff like this. And and horrific scenes that George has done. But at the same time, George has never been aggressive. Um, neither right. had the female ever been aggressive. Even when I'm really close to him, I hear him breathing. They're still not showing aggression. They're still showing cute interaction, whistles. And they try to flank me and get between me and the river and do you know all these little moves and throwing little shit. And, but this time, George was a 100% different animal. He was 100% in the presence of dad. He had to do what dad was doing. Dad doesn't like people. George can't like people when dad's around. Mm -hmm. And you could just pick up on it. So they adapted to father's presence and they right. all wanted to be tough in front of daddy's presence. So everything changed. The full dynamic of the group behavior completely changed with dad there. And um, then I moved out of there and, and did the thing. So Well, I know we're, we're starting to get short on time. I, I want to ask you, 
a couple questions, and I'm sure Mark has a couple things too. What, you know, when you go and do this, what is your most concerning, you know, issue that you have going into it this time, even with the, you know, the right crew and the right equipment? What, what, what's going to keep you on the edge the most of the time? Um, that, that this is a totally different dynamic. Um, I believe it's going to be similar to what I experienced there because it's going to be big males. I don't think they like people at all. They stay away from habitation so much they don't ever get used to people, so to speak, because they can just leave and you're never going to figure out where they went. And right. that it's a number of them getting together who all feel that way. Um, so that's kind of a bad scene in itself. And then knowing what potentially the lodge feature could be, um, if it is a lodge, if it is a retreat for big males and things, this is probably the one place you don't want to be. It's like, like I, I equate it to a Native American lodge for the elders or, or like I said, uh, a biker clubhouse. Um, that's, you know, there's kind of neutral ground everywhere. This, I don't believe, is going to be neutral ground, which is why they put such a large uh, area of demolition around it and, and an impossible travel zone around it. Obviously, they don't want anything coming in there be it deer, be it, you know, a mountain lion, no problem. Mountain lion, love that stuff. Ambush city. But what's it going to ambush? Nothing else going to walk through there. Um, right. So, but, so they're basically in there, uh, you know, unadulterated. They're, they're not messed with. They're safe. They're, nobody's going to walk upon them. And so that, I think that gives me the most trepidation. And then, you know, taking in other people into a situation like that, that's scary for me. Um, I wanted to make sure I took people who understood the danger um, or the potential danger of what they were getting themselves into um, because I would, I would never feel good if something occurs to somebody and you know, they weren't aware of it, then it's on me. And um, as well, we're not taking any females in this group and it's not because I'm, I'm, I'm that way. It's because that if you're, if you have a lodge or a feature like that, where it's, it apparently is male only, um, from everything we can see, then you don't take a female. You don't take right. you know, no kids. You don't take kids. You don't take anything, um, because obviously that could inspire um, an aggressive response in itself. Um, if they don't want females in the area, you know, this is the man house, and so that we don't want that to take that chance. So, those are really my greatest fears. I guess is is that. Well, one thing Chris said too is is that you're teaming people up. And, and taking such precaution of, you know, somebody can't go out and go to the bathroom by themselves. You always have to have two together. Have you already pre-picked who you want to be together based on what you know about them? Are there like little teams already set up or no. just going to let that play out? Yeah, it'll be largely fluid. And that'll be fluid based on each person's talents and abilities. Um, we will never break into small teams unless we have to. Right. Uh, we'll split down the middle. Uh, that'll put three to four on each team. Um, if we need, like when we're doing the lodge, lodge area kill zone, hey, if everything's cool and everything looks clear and we don't see um, any sign of any aggression, maybe they're hanging low, maybe they've backed off and they're just going to let this happen. Yeah, I may break into teams of two um, just to do that assessment, but we're not still not going to be out of visual contact with the other four, other four members of the team. Um, and then um, because I'm not, we're not going to be so anal about it as to designate. Um, we'll just, the, the, the thing is, it's a buddy system. And right. um, like we say, we're going to the bathroom. You know, I may not be rubbing shoulders with a guy like we're in Nam or anything like that. But at the same time, no one's going to be out of eye shot. Um, right. No one's going to be out of calm. You know, it's just, that's not going to happen. And, um, and, you know, so you need a group of guys who can work in that. You know, not a lot of people feel comfortable enough to even do that. Of course, you know, once they see what we're going to go see and experience what we're going to go experience, that'll, they probably wouldn't want to be anybody to be any farther from them when they're, when they're doing their business. So, Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's difficult when it's like something you said earlier is, you know, you, you can tell them, but it, until they're there and then they can, you know, something huge is there with them and the whole things that they do and all of the stuff that goes on with you, which really is considerable dealing with what's going on over there. Um, then you really know, you know what I mean? Like I've been in the bush with a lot of different people. And some people freeze and you talk and they're not hearing you. Some, it's like, you know, some people run, that, that's just happened before. Right. And then, and then in this situation, because we've conducted so many expeditions, I can tell you that I've probably experienced all of it at some point or another. Right. 
time I was too close and I, I couldn't move. I can tell you that right now. And then it walked away and I was thankful. But in the end, it's, you don't know until you yeah. get in with people, you know, and it's like, I, I found that over the, over the years on the expeditions where, you know, you, it's, it's, you know how it is when you're there, it's a good plan and everything. But when you get there and, and all of a sudden, man, people start realizing you know, this is like happening, like actually, you know, I just envisioned that it was happening, but now it actually is to keep the plan is really difficult. And, uh, and so I understand, you know, yeah. what you're going through as far as going into it, you know, especially from the, I know where we're going side of it and everybody else has to listen. Right. Well, I you know, think, I've been in that position before and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I guess I, I wouldn't want to even take them if I didn't know how I would react. So I know I've crawled in with big ones before and I didn't know I would act that way. Um, I didn't know I would do that, but I've belly crawled within 15 feet of, of, of one, the same size, um, before at the MJ 13 during the UNM study, um, because they got to see him, JC Johnson, and all of them, they got to see this big guy and we're talking really, truly massive, you know, I mean, compared to my head, a head this big with eyes like this, with four inches of space between them, um, really massive and they saw him and and they had no interest in going back in none of them and and so i went by myself and crawled belly crawled in and um and anyway uh sorry about that so i but i belly crawled in there and i and you know and i got within 15 feet of him and um uh, and and i found myself doing this you know and then i went back in with a little navajo buddy of mine uh june bug and, and we crawled even further in, got into the family group and, and got where there was one about eight feet from us. You can see his eye shine on video. And, and then the, there was a couple behind us pitching little rocks over our feet. And then, um, come on, let's go Topes. And then uh, about 60 feet, you know, we saw a juvenile by moonlight. We saw him keep crawling out and on infrared, you just see his eye shine when he's doing it, but we could watch him. And, and so we're watching him come up and, you know, at one point, he gets all the way to the the clear zone there. It's a kind of a sandy road with a post, and he makes it to the post. and And you see, uh, Junebug, my Navajo buddy, is actually reaching back to grab his big Bowie knife out of his out of his holster. And I actually, you'll see my fingers. I actually reach up and push it back in the holster, and tell him, "Don't even pull it, man. Don't even pull it out, bro." Just and I reach up and I'm pushing it back down. And um, I told him at that point, now here again, I don't know why. I said, look, if, if he comes out at us, man, you go by me. I'll take the hit. Man, that's a stupid thing to say, but that's the way I act, I guess, in these pinches, you know. And um, then they hit us with a rock at, you know, 60 feet. And it messed us both up. It hit us both. The rocks grazed his gut, left striped his, at, his gut, and then hit me in a spot and, and lame, damn near lamed us both. So, um, so I, But I know myself, so going into this thing as well, you know, I almost scare myself a little bit because I know what I'll, what I'll sit through you know, what I'll, what I'll tolerate. And, um, most of it's gut, you know, we actually were laying flat on the ground during that just to reduce the chance of being swiped and grabbed, um, just completely flat. Cause we're fodder anyway. And in this particular zone where we're going now, there's no running. Um, a guy can't run. Where are you going to go? You know, you're miles in and it's thousands of feet. You're going to have to go out of here to get out of here. And they own every single bit of this. And it's not just one. And it's not just one little pissed off. And, and I'll tell you, when I was run out of there with three chicks, um, I had made a clack sound. Well, one clacked at us. I clacked back to it, the same sentinel. Always been friendly exchange. And then I hit this rock together hard as I could. These two rock hard as I could. And I thought, ah, oh, that's pretty impressed with myself. That was pretty loud. And then, man, a big one, 180 from the other sentinel clack two rocks together sound like basketballs and it just through the canyons and it couldn't have been 250 feet away and just deafening man loud as a shotgun and um and then we actually hung for a few more minutes and then they a bunch uh several individuals gathered up down slope from us and what sounded like a smaller one started to kind of mouth off and then a larger one uh blah, 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 jumped his ass and you could tell the exchange going on. And then they rushed the trees and brush right up to where they were on the periphery of coming up. And I told them, girl, it's time to go, man. They are not playing. This is it. That was the last time. And let's get it out. And this was like 1030 or 11 o'clock in the morning. You know, man, so. Be safe in there. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what it's about. This is what we're going to try to be as safe as possible. But same time, we're going to go document this thing. We're going to do it. So it's got to get done. We're going to do it. Well, yeah. It's, we're getting right on the edge right now 
Uh, Marcus, do you have any other questions you want to ask him or any thoughts? Or wait for the footage, man. I'm waiting for the footage, buddy. Yeah, I, I know. I, I agree. I think it's a good group, so. yeah. Like I said before, I mean, uh, the, one reason why when I spoke to Chris last week about wanting to do this and say, you know, we're so excited that you are doing this is because it's like taking the community to a different level instead of doing the same thing you know stuff is starting to happen now and, and that's exciting right you know we know what's you know florida and, and obviously mark you know laying down in florida you'll you'll become gator bait pretty quick depending on where you are but like what you're doing it's it's exciting to hear because it's so different than what has been going on you know with mark and, and with us for for that matter so it's 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 and it's intriguing man oh i think so too it is intriguing especially you know last week ron in the chat said you know i don't think you really understand the dynamics of this and yeah. i said you're exactly right i don't i'm trying to i think i know what it's going to look like but i can't wait to see yeah the and, like and, mark says you know and that's coming from a 19 year usfs veteran exactly yeah so you know they've seen pretty much it all and you know i've I've seen enough to know better. And, um, but I, I just, I feel a calling to do this. I feel that the truth needs to be known, man. And nobody's going to get that without doing something period. And, um, so we've actually developed a motto for this expedition. I developed it the other day and that's, uh, uh, what would Shackleton do? Uh, you know, Shackleton, the uh, Antarctic explorer, right? I mean, there's no giving up in that guy. He was going to do it. It didn't matter what happened. He, and then there was just no giving up. There's just no stopping, period. There was no giving up. And uh, that's kind of... The guy they found frozen 100 years later, right? Well, no, no, no. Shackleton actually made it out and got his entire crew out oh, after that's, his... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. one of the... Best survival story on the planet, yeah. man. There's nothing better than what Shackleton pulled off. And then walked across uh, a, 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 a giant island feature. Where no one had even been across it. All the glaciers and stuff. And this just walked ac after sailing like 800 miles in a little bitty, you know, skiff in Antarctic waters and... And he managed to make it with one other guy out and, um, and, uh, and, you know, managed to go all the way back. And it was months and months and collected his entire crew and lost nobody. And so that's, that's the deal. You know, there's no giving up and there's no giving in on my guys. And, and uh, what would Shackleton do? So here we go. Well, well, I tell you what, that, that's, that's actually a good, a good motto. And then I guess, uh, you know, like I always, like Mark and I and, and Kerry always kind of joke about is, you know, between the three of us, I'm probably the slowest. Right. So, uh, and, and I got to learn how to trip if I am the slowest, but you know, it's just, I, I, you know, kudos, kudos, you know, you got the great team together. You're it's obviously five years of thinking this, you pretty much know how you want it to play out. Yeah. I mean, there was a point where I was going to do this alone if I had to, and I didn't want to, but there's such a calling to do this because still to this day, five years later, I've been waiting to look and five years later, I've still never seen a photograph like anything like what's in there. Nothing, nothing. So this, it needs to be done. And that's what we're all about, man. I, I want to bring reality to this. I don't like supposition. I don't like guesswork. Um, you know, this isn't like, you know, this isn't pulling up with a cooler and, and walking away from there into the hills and coming back to tents or, or even being able to run out of there in two hours and get to your pickup. We won't have a pickup there. Um, you know, this is drop off. We're in and we're in until we're not, you know what I mean? So, well, Chris even said, y'all even, y'all aren't even having fires. No, no. no. And then, you know, during a no, true doing our type of operation, our type of investigation work, um, there's no reason for that. I've never, ever had open flame or we don't camp. Um, there's actually very little talking. What there is, is usually at a whisper, um, for three days. You know, that's that's what it'll be. And so there's no, you know, sure, we're going to have fun and we will talk because they're going to know we're in there. There's no way we're going to sneak into this specific area besides full sniper crawl. Right. Uh, guys could get close. I've snuck up on Bigfoots before, man. I mean, it's not the first time I've done it quite a bit, but they've got sentinels. There's a bunch of individuals there. Um, they're watching trailheads, um, you know, and we're not going to spend three days just crawling on our bellies you know, in a ghillie suit to get in there. That's the whole thing. And that's what you'd have to do. So they're going to know. So yeah, it's not going to be as hardcore as that, but um, at the same time, there, there'll be no, you know, gallivanting around, wandering around by ourselves. Hey, I want to go look at this thing. I want to go look at that thing. 
you know, starting a fire, sitting around the fire, talking, having a good time. And, and that's just not going to exist on this because we're going in there for an operation. We can do all that when it's over. First night at GLST is my normal research area. I'm going to take those guys in where the family units are always at. I'm going to let them experience some of that, show them how to track. So I'm going to do instruction on how to track and how to follow a specific sign at GLST because I already know how to find it in there. And then we'll apply that up on the mountain. But I'm going to teach train the team in those methods up there and then uh, we'll have fire there like i said we'll we'll be cooking kebabs and steaks and in the morning we're gonna make bacon and eggs and cast iron and you know the whole nine yards and then and this will give us a chance for the meet and greet to go over plans and things like that and um and then once we're up on the thing it's an operation and no longer no everything changes so we will take a little mini butane stove to make coffee or or warm warm food or something like that but that's about it well, I tell you what, it's you know we, we're all definitely excited for you and, and can't wait for you to to come back and you know we obviously want to have you back on again when you get back and and the dust settles. Okay. Uh, you know, I think that's that's going to have to be a must because this is going to be just so interesting and and you know we we just want to hear you know the the good stuff the stuff that you know that that challenged you more than you thought it would and. Like I said, I, I hope I don't have an encounter. We, me and Ron and I feel the same way. And but I think Ron and I have both been in situations with these real big, big, big ones before. And it, it, there's nothing fun about it. This isn't. There's nothing fun. It's almost nothing gratifying until you get out, and then it's just as scary to think back what you just went through. It's still not a fond memory. It's it's like, oh, I made it. You know, I, I my surfboard got bitten half by a great white shark, and I remember that. And now I'm. You know, I sweat when I remember that memory. It's the same thing. And so we, we are hoping not to have any form of encounter. Um, I hope they're not within five miles of there, to be honest with you. Um, um, really, because we want to go document this lodge, and anything that happens is going to jeopardize that. And plus, it's just going to be absolute hor horrifying, you know. Um, yeah. When it's over, we get out of there, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll brag about it like it was nothing. Sure, absolutely. No, I won't. And, <laughs> and definitely drink a, a cold one and uh, all of the, uh, the whew, I'm glad we're home type yeah. thoughts. That'll be a big one. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you for coming on, Robert. Yeah. And your your website, somebody asked about it, uh, KX Crider Exploration. Exploration. Yeah, that's our YouTube site. We do have one, CriderExploration.com. It has not been okay. loaded up with Bigfoot stuff yet. There's there's some a little bit in there. Um, we are just we've just got that. We got it built a while ago and tried to prep and prime it uh, to begin to fill it. You know, we got well over a terabyte of uh, data to go in it right now, and um, it's going to take people other than myself. Basically, we got we're building a cooperative effort because I'm I spend so much time in in tech development, learning tech. Um, from the, the editing side to the field side and all that. And, and plus doing all the research we do and the field work that I just can't, I can't do everything. And so, right. um, so that's in waiting, but yeah, the best place to really find out is probably is our YouTube channel, which is KX, uh, Crider, Ex KX Crider Exploration. And then we're on Facebook all over the place. You can look up Crider Exploration or we have KX Cryptid Hominid. Uh, and that you can start with that. And that's a, it's a, like NM Bigfoot after that or whatever. And so these Facebook pages are primarily where we uh, post most of our ongoing stuff or whatever. Um, but yeah, so people are welcome to go check us out and offer any kind of support you can. And uh, we're always shadow banned. We're heavily, heavily uh, blocked on all the platforms. I mean, to an extreme extent, everyone that comes on, same thing, um, you know, um, and, and all of our followers say the same thing. Um, we've, I've actually had where Tara just, or Tara, I'm sorry, she just shared, Tara shared my name one day and she was warned by Facebook. They was, she was sharing content, not approved by Facebook to share. And it was just my name. So, um, oh my. yeah, That's, so uh... we can, you really use assistance from the masses in getting the word out because when we do hit this, we don't want what's been happened before, which is when the big names or others in the world that have more of an access either try to take this information and, and talk about it, become famous and take the stage, or they want to misinterpret it to their agenda or their, their story. And we want people to see it firsthand from us um, or one of our direct affiliates, like maybe you guys or, or a few others that we do work with. So, well, you know, again, just, you know, be careful. And I want to thank, uh, I didn't get a chance to acknowledge the people that did the super stickers and, and whatnot on there. So forgive me, 
thank you guys for doing that. And I yeah. guess last word, Robert. Uh, just um, we hope to see you guys later, you know, and we'll do the yeah. best we can for the masses. And that's why we do it to bring truth and to uh, put a thorn in the foot of those who have been hiding that truth from us. So hopefully we can bring some clarity to the whole subject and uh, and get maybe drop the supposition a little bit. and Let's get some reality going. That's about it. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, thanks, guys. Anyway, everybody, uh, thanks again for watching. And uh, is is I don't think I said earlier that Carrie and Linda are on a little mini vacation. And you know, say some uh, keep positive thoughts in your mind for Daniela and her father. So, with that being said and done, thank you guys, and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Robert. See you guys.